Okay, good evening everyone. So my name is Laura and I'm an academic at the Research School of Chemistry at ANU. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about my work. And it's a class of molecules that are both interesting, exciting, intriguing, and occasionally scandalous. And they are, of course, peptides. So what are peptides? Peptides are sort of the intermediary between amino acids and proteins. We already heard a little bit about proteins today from my colleague Damien. So you're probably very familiar with amino acids and, and this concept. So you look through the, the supermarket aisle and you may come across some sort of amino acid capsules or dietary supplements. We think of amino acids as being essential or non-essential. And this is all terminology that you might have heard before, right, in the past. You've probably also heard of proteins. So proteins are really important macronutrients. And we have a nice visual representation of proteins, right? Dairy, eggs, almonds, meat whatever you like, right? So we can understand conceptually what amino acids are and, and what proteins are. So what are peptides? Peptides are simply chains of amino acids, but they're much shorter and much smaller than proteins. The question though is, what image do peptides conjure up? For me, before I started working on them, I'd say not, not too much. Um, so when I began to work on peptides, I started to think that they really needed desperately a public relations campaign, right? We need some sort of image that comes to mind when we think about peptides, something exciting. It turns out, little did I know, that peptides did have quite a bit of publicity surrounding them, but it wasn't the publicity that I wanted. So not all publicity is good publicity. Um, it turns out that peptides came to be associated with words like trafficking, that's not great. <laughs> Serious risk of death, also not great. <laughs> and uh, even a rise in crime, right? So peptides, it seems, had quite a few red flags associated with them. So this concept of peptides being a warning signal. So where does that come from? Well, let's unpack this concept of peptide warning. So you might have been following the news. About five years ago, there was a huge doping scandal where a variety of rugby league players and clubs were found injecting uh, against league rules a variety of banned substances which were consistent with peptides. So the Australian Sports and Anti-Doping Authority actually issued a very strong statement warning not only against the Ill illegality, that's a hard word to say, uh, that they're banned substances, right, for rugby players, but league players. for league players, excuse me, I'm showing my ignorance of <laughs> Australian sports. <laughs> yeah, rugby is. league players, thank you, John. John is my supervisor. <laughs> um, it's my boss, yes, absolutely. Um, so also that they were not approved for human use. So one of the main factors that's very critical in this story is that the peptides that were being injected were not really scientifically evaluated in the rigorous sense that we think of when we start to talk about pharmaceuticals and drug development. So let's meet one of the players, uh, a scandalous peptide. So this very small molecule, it's a hexapeptide, which means it's comprised of only six amino acids. So very small little peptide. We can make it in the lab in a day. We won't, but we could. And it's called growth hormone releasing hexapeptide, or GHRP. So what does that mean? Well, as the name implies, it uh, induces production of growth hormone. So that in turn can enhance production of muscular tissue, or it might be able to you know, increase uh, your physical ability or reduce the amount of time that it takes to recover from an intense bout of physical activity. So this peptide was one of the key ingredients that players were injecting, right? So the problem there is not that it's not efficacious, it most likely does work. The problem is safety and the fact that it's not regulated. So uh, players were not going to doctors to get prescriptions for drugs that are coming from pharmaceutical companies. They were sourcing them from all sorts of places. Thankfully, they weren't sourcing them from this particular chemist who's holding a vial full of peptide shown here. So I have to say, as a research chemist, we managed to stay above the fray for the most part. But that's not to say we didn't have ideas of what could be um, with the substances that we make in the lab. So again, John is my supervisor. I'm not promoting any sort of doping to enhance my performance. I was going to say that these are actually my real muscles, and that's why I'm joking. But. But we were amazed to see that beyond the idea of doping, peptides really caught on. 
So there's a huge market now for peptides. If you Google peptides in Australia, which I did here, um, you'll see that there's a huge what they call gray market. It's a little bit of an ambiguous area, right? These are not illegal substances by any means, but should you be injecting them? Well, allegedly there are more than 40,000 satisfied patients, according to one of these online distributors of peptides. So let's look at the type of peptides that you can actually buy. Well, there's this peptide and cantaloupe cream. That sounds very alluring. Um, very uh, vaguely labeled peptide bottle. Not sure I would want to take that. Fish peptides recommended by this doctor, so seems trustworthy. Um, my favorite is collagen peptide jelly sticks, a delicious way to increase the shininess of your hair and your nails. You can also enjoy a peptide drink. So I might suggest that Smith's Alternative start carrying this uh, lovely colored brown peptide juice. Um, you can also increase your romantic prowess with this um, oxytocin navel spray. Nasal spray, excuse me, not navel spray. <laughs> that would be bad. Called OxyLove. So clearly <laughs> there are a variety of questionable peptide-based products out there on the market. So how do we cut through the fray? What can peptides actually do for us? Well, that's what I'm interested in as a researcher, and that's what I hope to tell you a little bit about in the three minutes or so that I have left to talk about my research. So it turns out that peptides are absolutely crucial in drug discovery. So we've been using peptide drugs for years. Insulin is probably the most famous blockbuster peptide-based drug out there on the market. But you also have vancomycin, and this is the antibody, antibiotic of last resort. So this is one of our last tools in the fight against resistant bacteria. So vancomycin is absolutely crucial. It turns out that peptide drugs in general fill a very, very interesting void in the common range of drugs that we have currently available on the market. So we often think of drugs as being small molecules, things like aspirin, right? Small molecule structures. We've now introduced the realm of protein therapeutics or biologics, and these are becoming increasingly more important now. Uh, you'll notice I chose EPO. No coincidence, it's had a bit of a doping scandal of its own. But regardless, peptides are in this nice intermediary in terms of size between these two extremes. And they fill this very, very interesting and very, very promising gap uh, as a source of promising new therapeutics. So why peptides? Well, we've isolated and identified more than 7,000, and this is a very conservative estimate, but more than 7,000 naturally occurring peptides, and they fill all sorts of different biological roles. So we have neurotransmitters, hormones, growth factors, anti-infectives, you name it. Peptides are responsible for several different biological functions. And even more so, despite what the doping scandal would have you believe, peptides are generally selective and efficacious. So in terms of therapies and potential treatments, they tend to have very, very good safety profiles. And you can see this in, in the numbers. So there are more than 60 approved peptide drugs on the market and hundreds more in clinical and preclinical development. So there's a lot of promise in this area and it's on an upward trend. So what do I do? Well, as a synthetic chemist, it turns out that peptide drugs on their own, uh, native peptides rather, are generally unsuitable for direct use in the clinic. So it's hard to take a native peptide and turn that into a therapeutic straight away. You need to undergo a variety of different structural modifications. So as a synthetic chemist, my aim is to use cutting edge chemistry, so synthetic tools, if you will, to take native peptides composed of native natural amino acids and utilize select strategies to modify those peptides. So we're tailoring, chopping, cutting, changing that structure ever so slightly to optimize biological activity and also optimize the properties of this compound as a therapeutic. So in my lab, we're working on antiparasitic peptides. We're also working on some new and novel antibiotics. So I hope that what we can do with this research is to move beyond uh, the concept of peptides as being an unknown, right? And give them really a new beginning. So beyond this photo, which I know will come back to haunt me, um, and towards the idea that peptides can be absolutely powerful therapeutics and that they can have a real positive benefit on human health. So I'd just like to thank everyone who makes this work possible. Uh, these are my students in my new but growing lab. I'd like to thank um, all of our technical support, funding, of course, the ANU uh, and the RSC, as well as research funding, which I hope there will be more of in the future. Thank you.